Good morning, church. How we doing? Just got back from Ukraine a couple weeks ago. Uh, want to share a message, want to give a couple stories. You know, one of the highlights of going to other countries is that you can hear how different cultures experience the move of God. And, and to me, it's always encouraging. Uh, when we were there, I heard a story uh, of a guy who's a chaplain, and he knows a family, and they were in one of the cities that was getting shelled and rocketed by the Russians. And he knows them personally, and this is the story that the husband, wife, and two or three kids got on their knees in their living room and began to pray. And so as they were praying, a rocket hit and blew up in their house. The doors blew off the hinges, the windows blew out, went over their heads, and they survived. Now, I want you to just think about that picture for a minute. You know, they said there was total peace, They were aware of what was happening, but it wasn't terrifying. A second rocket enters and hits in the kitchen and doesn't detonate. Now, I heard that, and here's my first thought. The safest place is always on your knees. Isn't that true? That's the safest place. Now, the sad, the tragedy of it is 21 of their neighbors got killed in that same attack. Crazy stuff. Then there's this other story. Here's a national hero in Ukraine, a lady. She's in her apartment, it's a high rise, and she sees a Russian drone go through. A Russian drone. So what does she do? She goes to her refrigerator and she gets a jar of pickles. Poor K. Spanish, working on my Spanish here. She grabs the jar of pickles, The drone comes back through. She throws it, hits the drone, takes it out of the sky. It's done. She is a national hero. You can YouTube, just YouTube, Pickle Lady, Ukraine. Now, she's been on every newscast in Ukraine. She is a hero. And they got the story wrong. One of the reporters said she used potatoes. She said, I did not use potatoes. I used pickles. That's important. When you're taking down drones, man, you better have them the right weapons in your hands. We are in a series called Spirit Led. Surrender and obedience as a way of life. And this, this is really good. And so, you know, I really felt like the Lord impressed on me to just share being spirit led to be a blessing. Everybody say be a blessing. Now, the problem with me is I'm a very works oriented person. So what I do, my inclination is to go right after what can you do to be a blessing and, you know, come up with exhaustive lists so that everybody can be a part of it, you know. And and, and as as I started just going that route, which is my familiar route, and the Holy Spirit basically said, that's just really out of order. I was like, well, out of order? What are you talking about? I'm talking about how people can just bless the kingdom, bless people and all this and... But no, you have to get the first things first. And, and here's the first things. Romans chapter 8 says this. Now look at this. Let's read it together, okay? Ready? Go. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the what? The sons of God or the children of God. Now, that is the main event right there. Notice it doesn't say that as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're going to do great works for me. Although that's true, right? That's totally true. It doesn't say that as many as are led by the Spirit of God, there's going to be great miracles. There's going to be great signs and wonders. Now, don't shut off. That's true. We believe in that. We walk in that. I, I anticipate that every single place that I go. But the main event is that you and I fully realize and understand that being led by the Spirit is really having an understanding. I mean, the first principle is that you and I are sons and daughters of the Most High God. Before we ever do anything for God... Who we are in God is number one. Now, now think about this. Every parent I've ever met, ever, when they have children, the first word they teach the children is what? Well, if you're a dad, it's say daddy, say daddy, daddy. And the moms, you know, they're over there. Mommy, mommy, and there's always this little race, you know, what word gets uttered first? And I'm convinced that all three of my kids said daddy first, but LaDonna would debate that issue. But that's the first thing. Isn't it interesting that there is no parent in his or her right mind that tries to teach their kid as a first word, 
chores. Can you say chores? Achievement. Come on, Johnny. Achievement. Success, Johnny. Sally, Sally, get ahead. Grind. Say grind. Can you say grind? Can you say hustle? Hustle. Awards. Can you say awards? No, that's out of order. That may or may not come later, but what's the first principle? The first principle is that they understand. You're the child. I'm the dad. I love you. We're in family together. That's the main event, isn't it? We have to know that if we don't know that, if you don't have a revelation of that, I would suggest that your motivation for doing anything for God, anything for the kingdom of God, will be out of order. It will. The motives will be skewed. If you get that our obedience and our surrender is just because we're wired that way by God, the works that we do are almost second nature. There's not, there's not a whole lot of, oh, this is going to sound bad. You almost don't have to pray a lot about being a blessing. No, you, you, you really don't. And so I'm going to dive into this. I'm gonna, we're only going to go through a couple of verses. But, you know, when Jesus was baptized, and this, this has always got me. And, and this, if you're a performance-oriented per person, this is going to get you too. When Jesus was baptized and he came out of the water, what were the words the Father uttered from heaven? This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Isn't it interesting that God didn't say, this is my beloved Son who is going to shake the world up. This is my beloved son who is, who is going to display signs and wonders the world has never seen. No, it was words of affirmation. And I would say, whoever this is for, because I didn't plan on this part of the message, boy, go after a revelation of who you are as a son or a daughter of the King Most High, Jesus. It's a big deal. Now, we're just going to go for... Three, three verses. I'll quote some verses. I'm going to have some team members share. But Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now, we're going to trace our roots here just for a minute. This is Abraham. If you know anything about Abraham in the Old Testament, you see that Abraham is considered a friend of God. He's, the, he's considered the father of our faith. It's through his lineage that Jesus comes through. It is through his lineage that you and I pass through. And we are considered Abraham's seed, and we'll get to that later. And that, that's kind of, it's kind of a big deal, but we're going to see what does it look like when a man is in covenant, and then how do we understand our engrafting into this whole thing? And to me, I think it's absolutely fascinating. Verse 1 of Genesis chapter 12 says this, The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country your people, and your father's household to the land that I will show you. I just want to say this briefly. God still speaks today. It's very normative for God to speak. God is speaking all the time. If you have a Bible, God's words are available to you 24-7. You don't have to make an appointment. You don't have to phone a friend. You don't have to do anything. As all you have to do is pick it up, and he will speak to you. He's also speaking audibly, kind of, internally, impressionistically, um, but he's speaking all the time. And once again, if that's something you need to hear, you need to understand, it's very normal for fathers to communicate with their sons and daughters. And our father is no different. So I, I pray that your ears are open to hear just the nugget of revelation that God wants you to get today. And here's what's interesting. You have to know this about Abraham. The people that God chooses to represent him, to be patriarchs and matriarchs, you need to understand, are not perfect people. So even in this, right, verse 1 tells us that Abram only got one out of three. I mean, his first, the first thing that happens here is that God says, you're going to go from your country and your people and your father's household to a land I'm going to show you. The only thing he got right was he took off to go to the land that God would show him eventually. But he didn't forsake his family. He didn't forsake his household. He let some of them come. It's interesting that in the New Testament, Abraham is mentioned 75 times. In the book of Hebrews, he's mentioned a lot. And, but you know what's not mentioned about Abraham in he Hebrews? Never his failures. And if you read from here through Genesis, uh, you, you will see that he fails a lot. So you just need to understand, failure 
does not get in the way of God using anybody. Because God's God, and he's going to use who he chooses to use. Now, I would say that his priority is that we cooperate well with him, that we get things right, make things right, when things do get a little whacked here. But this is, this is Abram, man. Leave. Leave the comfort. Leave the familiarity. Leave your family. Leave your identity. Leave the good, bad, and the ugly. And, and some of you need to hear this. God's next is always better than your what was. Say it again. God's next is always better than your what was. The Bible says we go from faith to faith. Love my previous faith. Love the next faith. We move from glory to glory. Or the weightiness. We, we live and walk in the weightiness of God. The glory of God. And we go from glory to glory. We go from grace to grace. Now that being said, I'm not saying that what was wasn't painful, that didn't involve crisis, disaster, loss, ruin, addiction. I mean, fill in the blank. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the presence of God ensures that your next will always be better than your what was. And that takes just a little faith. How many of you would say your past is littered with a lot of failures? Just, just raise your hand. A lot of failures. And how many of you would say that where you're at right now in Christ is better than that? Let me ask you this. How many of you have anticipation in God for a better next? Okay, this isn't on you. You need to hear this. This isn't on you. We love to somehow marry grace and works. And I, I want you to ditch works and embrace grace because what we're seeing right here is that God, the heavy lifting, has already done by God. I, we don't get that. We need to get that. And I'm going I'm to just like spell it out right here. Look at verse 2. Second, I will. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. When God says, I will, it gets done. I will. You will be a blessing. That statement is emphatic. You have no choice other than to be a blessing. What is a blessing? Being a source of wholeness and well-being for others. A source of peace to people. That's what being a blessing is right there. And once again, you don't really need to draft a lot of big plans for that. You, you just need to walk through this planet and just see, where does there need to be some peace in a person's life? Where, do, where does there need to be some order where there's out of order? Where do, where, it literally means to be a gift. You're going to be a gift. I mean, to me, that's profound. It's a profound way to live. And once again, when you, when you think like this, you demystify some of the rhetoric around the will of God. Because I know a lot of people that have spent more time and more years frustrating, being frustrated at, am I doing the will of God? Am I knowing the God? What if I miss it? And they get caught up and hung up. And you know what? It, it is paralysis by analysis. Look, you're filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Think of yourself as a dispensary. Not that kind of dispensary. Don't go there. I want you in your right mind here. You, just, you and I simply go, and we just look for needs. Or we like, I mean, and once again, I could give you story after story after story. Somebody catches me on my sidewalk, 20 minutes in the heat, it's 102 degrees, talking, problems, family problems. Just thought, can we pray right now? He's sweating. Yeah, sure, on the sidewalk in my neighborhood, just praying. That whole th encounter took about eight minutes. They were blessed. They were crying. It was hot. It was inconvenient. But God met them on the sidewalk in front of 510 Hydrangea Court. This is great. So I'm going to show you something here, this little clip here. This is Haiti. One of the things we do there 
build churches. Uh, another time I'll let you know on the big project that we're involved in that's much bigger than it was supposed to be. But no, that's Ukraine. Wrong slide. Let's go Haiti. Nope, that's not Haiti. Nope, that's not even Haiti. That's Ukraine. There should be a little video. Okay, just now, just look at this. There's a lady, a matriarch in the faith, that since 1985 has been praying for the 12 churches that her husband planted as a doctor in the mountains of the place we go called Plaisance de Sud. This is hard place. This is out, I mean, it's out in the middle of nowhere. Um, it's hot. It's humid. Her prayer was that all 12 churches would have buildings. So over the years, I've brought some friends down there. Uh, they took it upon themselves to actually start building churches. Uh, my nonprofit has built churches. Rock of Roseville has built churches. And I would say, I, I don't know if it's 12 out of 12 now, but this might be the 12th church. This is a mile and a half up the mountain uh, to a community of 79 families that have no, so, no resources at all. There's, no, there's nothing up there, but God wants a church. And when God says, I want a church there, there's going to be a church there. Now, that video right there shows how that church is being built right now. Everything has to be carried by hand. Everything, every block, every bag of cement, every, everything to build a church, all the steel, all the rebar has to be carted up by hand. And they're using men, women, and children from that community. Now, there's been some casualties there. Um, there, there was a mule that was helping us, and the mule died. I know, it's sad, I don't even know why I'm showing you, but I'm just saying there's to be a blessing, there's always a price to be paid, okay? And so the mule didn't make it, and uh, I don't even know why I got that there. But it's, you need to know some of the reality of what goes on out there, and mules die. Mules die. People didn't die. We had bought that mule and then told the guy that is our main guy there that if the mule lives, you can keep the mule. And he was excited, but he's not excited right now because the mule died. The great news is that I associate with an, enough people that get it, and I just sent out two texts. That's all I did, two texts. I said, the mule died, we wanna buy two mules. Uh, do you have $500 to buy a mule? Two people responded very quickly and said yes. So now, as of right now, there's two more mules to replace, because God's next is better than a dead mule. Anyways, <clears throat> verse three. Vegetarians are, vegetarians are just dying right now. They're just dying. I was going to say that mule had one bad day, but he probably didn't. He probably had a few bad days. Anyways, um, verse 3. Once again, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all the people on the earth will be blessed. Now, you need to understand that this is God's response to the idolatry in Genesis chapter 11. So before chapter 12, you have chapter 11, and what do you have? You have a bunch of pagan worshipers, heathens, that are saying things like this. We're going to make our name great. We're going to build a tower to, the, to, to, to heavens. We're going to do this. We're going to do this, and it's all about them. It's all about man's plans. Well, Genesis 12 just tells us what God thinks of man's plans. He enacts his plan. And it's interesting that he uses more language of the same that they used. We will do this. We will do this. God said, no, 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 no. I will do this. I will do this. And I will do that. And that's what happens. And you need to focus on those two words when God says, I will. Now, here's three verses. We're just going to go through real quick. Once again, I didn't plan on this direction. But you, you need to understand that... Um, some of you grunt your way through Christianity. You do. You strive. You strain. You try to earn. Uh, you get well preachers that say, you better do this, and if you don't do that, and they make threats and things like that. But I'm telling you, very rarely do I hear leaders talk about the finished work of Jesus. It's finished. We rest in that. We cooperate with God through that. We don't, we don't strain. We don't stress. Now, I want you to see this. I'm sure of this. He who began a good work in you will, will bring it to complete. Who brings it to completion? 
Are you sure it's not you? No, it's him. He said, now, get it. It doesn't look pretty at times. I look in mirrors too. Oh, God. You, you. I've gone to pastor's conferences. I'm seriously. I've gone to pastor's conferences. I've looked and I went, you're in trouble, God. You were in, this is just trouble. But he started the work. You didn't start the work. He gave you the faith to believe before you believed. He initiated the work. He completes the work. Give me the next one. The next one. <laughs> Who will sustain you to the end? Guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. Who's faithful? God's faithful. This is what I know about people. People are fickle. True. They're fickle in their love. They're fickle in their devotion. They're fickle in their obedience. They're fickle in their surrender. People are people. And they're fickle. But God is faithful. I love that. His faithfulness trumps. Can I say that word? Trumps <laughs> my fickleness and your fickleness. Give me the next one. Second Timothy 4.18. The Lord will rescue me. Who's going to rescue you? Yeah, not you. The Lord's going to rescue you from every evil deed. Bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. That's just good stuff. Once again, I could come up with 50 more verses that, that just center on his will. What he says he's going to do. He's going to accomplish it. As long as you and I do. Okay, here's your, your big responsibility. You ready? Because some of you are works oriented and like me, and you want to do something. Here's what you do. You cooperate with him. That's it. You cooperate. You just say, I don't want to do this. I don't even want to. Okay. All right. And as you grow, grow and go over time, it gets easier. Now, it gets bigger, but it gets easier because you have more experience. You kind of know, you know, in this situation, I used to do that. That was dumb. That was really dumb. I'm going to learn from my mistake. I'm just going to co I'm just going to cooperate. And it's not God twisting your arm, say, Uncle, oh, Uncle, Uncle. No, 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 no. It's just a cooperation. It really is the blessed life. So the story you and I are engrafted into is the story of the I wills of God. So, real quick. God's blessings, because he, he blessed Abram. Material wealth and prosperity fruitfulness. Now, once again, don't go crazy on that. This isn't a prosperity gospel. This is just a real tangible thing on how God blessed people. Well, how much? I don't know. <laughs> how much do I get? I don't know. I know you get more than enough. I know that because that's what dads do. They give more than enough. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give good gifts to those that ask him? So we're in this. He got favor. Intimacy with God. As you read through Genesis, you will see this. He has a presence. God's presence is with him. God's goodness is with him. He has stature, reputation, and significance. You think about it. Abraham walked in all the things that the world on their own terms struggles for. Fame, notoriety, likes, wealth, prosperity. They strive for that. That's just simply an inheritance for us. Because here's what the scripture says. Those who are of faith, how many of you are of faith? You're of faith. Okay. Those of you who are of faith are the sons of Abraham. Oh, what? Yeah, we're in the lineages. His inheritance is our inheritance. Romans 8, 17. We are children and heirs of God. Fellow heirs with Christ. What's an heir? A person inheriting and continuing of the legacy of a predecessor. It's amazing. Verse 3. I'll bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you. So what does spirit-led life look like? I mean, and this is simple, but God, it's just really true. We live in the blessings of God. I mean, now think about that for a minute. Some of us think of a blessing of God as something that you get, this like tangible article that gets given to us, and you say, I was blessed. But when you think about living in the blessings of God, it means like understanding we've been rescued, redeemed, delivered, filled with joy, filled with peace. 
I mean, called with a purpose. I mean, given gifts, gifts of the Spirit. It's given. This is just, we live in this thing. We live in a calling. And, and I, you know, let me just say, as, as I look back over my life, and it's good because when you get old, you get to look back and you say things like that. As I look back over my life, you think, well, he's old. Yeah, he gets to say that. So as I look back over my life, um, I just see every season and chapter, you know, where God has led me, it, it is just better and better and better. And I realize some positive, what do you call them, positive talkers? What do you call those success motivation people like that? You know, they can say some of the same stuff, but it will always be lived on natural terms, not spiritual terms. It, oh, I don't even have time to go into how blessed I am, but I, I do want to just, I do want to say that when God called me down here, it was better than the good that happened in Washington, and it was blessed. It was fruitful. And then 15 years here, and then I have a pastor that gets missions and gets out of the box, um, gets that. It's blessed. Got to retire. I retired a year ago this week. <laughs> I was thinking about that. I'm retired, but somehow I'm busier in a good way and doing more than I've ever done. And there's more fulfillment and more satisfaction. Unbelie un stinking believable. Pam and Mike, come on up here real quick. Pam and Mike. So spirit-led life is we live in the blessings of God. Jesus made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Made unto us. Gave that. The second thing is we live to be a blessing. So the gospel and good works always go hand in hand. Always. Hand in hand. So these guys, we, most of our team, LaDonna is at a single mom's outreach. Um, a couple of the other team uh, is out of town, Amy and uh, Gunner. Um, so I just want you guys to share just one blessing that you experienced or you gave or an encounter, you know, that God takes average ordinary people like us, takes us to a place that has some needs, and just what happened. So thank you uh, for having us go. This was amazing, and this was definitely a spirit-led um, mission trip. And I uh, just want to thank, give a shout out to like Varva and her family um, for housing us and hosting us. It was amazing. Thank you so much. And uh, wow, uh, a few things I could tell you. Like yeah, 50, 50 scriptures uh, all day, all night. I can tell you stories. But um, one thing I wanted to say was before I went on a mission trip, I prayed, and the um, the term in my mind came up, and I, I believe wholeheartedly it was God. Um, showing me um, the quote, such as time as this. Now, I didn't remember where that came from and what uh, scripture verse it came from. And then I looked it up, and it was from Esther 4.14. And it just kind of correlates with our worship today and your message today. So today was a very big confirmation that this was all much needed and spirit-led. Um, one of the amazing stories that I, got, I get to share today is that I... Um, encountered a gal named Nadia. She's from Bucha, um, Ukraine, and she's one of the refugees that showed up at one of the charitable organizations that we visited. And man, what a heart, what a, what a warrior she is. And uh, her strength and her nobility and her love and her um, perseverance really shined through that day that we met her, encountered her. And um, she got to tell us her story. And it was, it was heart hard to hear, um, and it was sad, but it was also enlightening, and it was hopeful, and so um, we got to get together with her, and we prayed over her, and we prayed over her family, who is still there in Ukraine um, in the red zone area, and if you guys know what red zone means, it's the active place of where the Russians are uh, invading. Um, she was emotional, and she was very thankful, very thankful for all of you guys that um, supported us. So we weren't the only ones there. You guys were there in spirit. So we just, yeah, awesome. Thank you, guys. That's good. Yeah, it definitely was a blessing to go. Um, I, I'll be honest, like I, when they said they were going to go over to Poland and Ukraine, I was like, 
well, I'm supposed to go, but I have no reason why I would want to go. Is I have no connection, no nothing. But the Lord just kept pressing in on it, and it's funny, spirit-led. It's definitely what it was. And so, you know, I went there and kind of really kind of wondering what was going to be happening. You know, lots of different things. I don't really have a lot of medical backgrounds. So I can't do that. But I do know is that Holy Spirit's with me, and I can pray with people. You know, I could see healing happen. We could see miracles, all that stuff. And so I was expectant there. We, uh, in our travels, we came across a gentleman that stood out, mainly because he had a big old U.S. military uh, T-shirt on uh, at the border. And we're like, who's this guy? And he speaks English. He's on his phone. And so I, we woke, go over there. We start talking to him. His name's Kevin. And uh, he is a, a, a Marine veteran, just retired firefighter, search and rescue guy, 35 years. And we asked him, what are you doing here? He goes, I don't know. I just grabbed my stuff and I left. You know, so I'm thinking of this first, you know, Genesis 12, 1. He left home. He left everything, his family. And he goes, I don't know why I just showed up, but I did. And I'm here searching for somebody. And he goes, I don't know how to connect. Here's the thing, if you guys don't know, like, I was in the Navy as a kid. I've done lots of stuff. So, like, when you get around somebody who speaks the same kind of heart language, you just connect. And, you know, I sat there and talked to him for a few minutes, and we connected on a level that... It's hard to explain. I don't know where he's at in his walk with God at all. All I know is it was a heart connection. And he's just like, I just want to serve. And we had an opportunity to connect with some other groups. And uh, we're like, well, we don't know. We can get you there. We'll figure out something. And that night we sat there talking. And, and Pam and I and Gunner were like, I don't know what we're going to do. But we're going to make sure we do something. And Gunner and I, the next morning, we drove all the way back over there. Grabbed him. And he was standing there. He goes, he I hopped out of the car, looks at me, goes, you came back for me. Yeah. Yeah. We're like, yeah. yeah. Yes, we did. Yeah. We snagged him up and we took him over to a humanitarian aid area and I walked him in. This him and I, I prayed him around through, pray sounds a word, bad word. I walked him around, kind of showed him what was area and where he could plug into. And uh, before I left, I said, man, can I pray with you? Yeah. I just, you know, I feel like, you know, this is a connection that's going to be a, a long time. He goes, please. We prayed right there in the middle of everything. And looked at me, he goes, thank you for not forgetting about me. That's it. That's it. Let's stand up together. I mean, once again, I love the fact that when we had our debrief over at my house on Friday night, <clears throat> when people were talking about Ukraine, they all talked about individual encounters with people that God had already set up. Now, we did big things. One of the big needs was gas. So we put 81 liters of gas in the trunk of a rental car. That could be called an explosive device. But because that's what they needed for chaplains to get supplies to the front lines. So we did that. We bought hefty bags full of medicine, bandages, all that kind of stuff. So there was the elements of the big things. But you need to understand. God takes you to places where people need to hear. We stayed one night in a hotel, and I talked to the lady, you know, and I just said, hey, how you doing? Da, 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 da. And all of a sudden, man, she just pours out her heart. My, my daughter has special needs. I'm single. And you could tell she was just an amped up, stressed out woman. So through the next couple of days, we just talked to her. You know, she served us. And then I said, hey, I said, we're leaving. Can we pray for you? She's working. She says, yeah, okay. So we went into a, a little banquet, empty facility. Team got around this lady. She prayed for her. She started weeping. So when I think about blessing, I always think about, I think about the big things, of course. The building, the buildings, the big things, buying the mules, all that. I also think about those one-on-one -on -one encounters. Jesus encountered you individually. Not as a package deal, but individually. So I want to pray for us, and, and I want you to just respond to this here. Okay, when I first started talking, I talked about God's heart and desire. First of all, is that you would understand that you are sons and daughters of God. That, that's the main event. I mean, seriously. And, and I want you to just think about this verse right here in 1 John. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us 
that we might be called the children of God. It's a main event verse for me right there. Some of you don't have that. Some of you are Christians, but you almost kind of like live a life that look busy. Jesus is coming back. <laughs> you know, there's a little freneticism with you in your soul. And so I just want to pray for you. If you're somebody that really hasn't kind of got that revelation that above all else, you are a son or a daughter of God, I just want to pray for you. Just shoot your hand up. Or if you know there needs to be a little more work in that area, just raise your hand. Just keep it up. I want to pray that. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I declare over these people, you are a good father. Your word says your spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And so I pray every person here that has that hyper works orientation, that they somehow have to add to what you did for us. I pray, give them a revelation, open the eyes of their understanding that they would see you and then they would know you as our father in heaven. Pray for that, God. Pray for people that still think that either their best days were behind them or that it's been all bad up to this point and they have no reason to believe that it will get any better. Once again, Lord, I pray that you would reveal that what you have for us next is way better than what was. I bless these people, God my brothers and sisters, your sons and daughters. I bless them right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.